Bob, at this point, I would like to ask you, what was, um, how did you use MobLab um, at your classes at the University of Toronto in the past years? Uh, so, so um, lucky for me, I wasn't teaching this last semester, so I don't have any experience with the abrupt transition. But what I'd like to do, in, in the, you know, and I want to keep this relatively brief because I know everyone wants to start uh, looking at our new, at MobLab's new asynchronous play feature. But what I'd like to do is just briefly review what I think is important in the way that I run my synchronous sessions, because I think that's going to provide a rationale for how I'm planning on running my asynchronous sessions. And so the first thing that I'll point out is, for the last few years, I actually don't run MobLab games in my lecture. Right? Instead, what I do is um, we have an hour a week of what we call tutorials or, or discussion, right? and these are led by teaching assistants and their smaller group. And it's in these tutorials that my students play Mob Lab games. Um, so as a result, I'm a big fan of scripting out right, what a, an activity is going to look like and you know, thinking ahead of time, what is the activity path that I want my students to follow? Because with my teaching assistants, I have to lay this out. And invariably, right, always start, as Kelvin was saying, you know, making sure your students uh, understand the rules of the game, super important. I always start with detailed instructions, almost always have my TAs display mo the Mob Lab uh, provided instruction videos. Um, Often I will have a quick uh, comprehension question, make sure students understood the instructions. Right? Then we'll play the game. Right? And what I think is really important is a debrief session. Right? As Kelvin sort of reported, right? showing the results, super important. Right? And also tying these results back into the theory. And yes, sometimes uh, the results uh, agree with theory and other times, right, we get results that are not predicted by theory and being able to, you know, ask students, right, why, you know, what did they do that might have caused these, these results that don't accord with, with theory. Right? What I also think is really important and which the research has shown is that if you want um, student participation experiments to be powerful, you have to give students an opportunity to reflect on what they've done. Right? And so a great example that I use for a number of games is sort of say, let's say that your friend is going to play this game. Right? How would you advise your friend to play in order to make, you know, earn as many points as possible? Right? And I'll have students you know, respond to, to this, you know, write a few sentences reflecting on what they did and what they would suggest to a friend. And I find that this reflection opportunity really does a great job in cementing, um, in cementing the lesson, right? And the one last thing that I, I wanna point out is I am a big fan of, of binary grading. I, the student's performance in a Mob Lab uh, activity in no way influences her grade, except insofar as she's participated, right? So I might say something, right? You get full credit as long as you sincerely participate, trying to avoid students who might want to troll the game. But, you know, as Kelvin pointed out, I find most students take this very seriously. All right, so that's how I run the synchronous sessions. And, you know, when we talk about async, we'll see a similar sort of, of structure.